Roy Winston frequents high-stakes cash games in Southern California, but he is certainly no slouch when it comes to tournament poker. In the past two years, he has earned upwards of $2.5 million on the circuit. Last year, Winston became a World Poker Tour champion when he won the Borgata Poker Open. We have Winston in the studio today for this episode of Calling Station. Hi, welcome to the show. Uh, you're on the air. Hi, is this Roy? Yes. Hi, Roy. Um, actually, I have a question about uh, under the gun play with pocket pairs, like mid pocket pairs. See, my major problem is that when I'm sitting with like a medium sized stack, I don't really know what to do with nines or lower. Do I do I limp in and just get raised out of the pot? Do I raise it up under the gun and have to fold to a re-raise? I just seem to be getting shut out of these pots, and I don't know if like the best option is just to fold it all together. Well, you know, it's actually a very good question, and I, I think every time I look at one of those you know, low to mid pairs and I'm in early position, I, I sometimes have to think about it. I think it depends on the texture of the table that you're playing on. Too. Are you are talking about a cash game or in a, or in a tournament? A tournament. In because um, that does that does vary, but also in the in the tournaments and the cash games, the stack sizes you're dealing with become very important. Also, because you have to know that obviously to with a small to medium pair, most of the time to to win the hand, especially in a multi-way pot, you're going to need to um, hit the pair and flop the set, and you know that's only going to happen uh, about one in seven times. So you got to be able to get paid off the right amount. So if you you're if you're forced to raise or call a re-raise you got to know that their stack size uh, and your stack size make sense on that. So that's one of the things I think about with small pairs. And then the other thing is I, I most of the time will raise with them. And the reason is I think when I see someone in, in a tournament uh, uh, limp in early position, most of the time I have to think that they have a small suited ace or they have a small pair. And that's, you know, I'm, you know it's not going to be every time, but it's going to be a lot of the time. So when I, when I have a smaller pair myself, I think that uh, raising with it, uh, camouflages the hand a little bit and gives me the ability to to represent other hands depending on the texture of the flop. And, and again, you know, part of play is varying. I don't I don't always do the same the same thing in each circumstance. So so uh, does that answer it kind of or? Uh, it does. But I was wondering when I get flat called in position, uh, do I normally continuation bet hands that or flops that I don't hit? Um, well, that's that's actually a really good uh, question. I don't always continuation bet. And the reason is I, I like to what I call continuation bet with with data. And by that I say I like to be able to get a read on my opponent. So if if it looked to me like they missed the flop, I will continuation bet. If it looked to me like they hit the flop, I am uh not going to not going to uh, bet it and again like you said since we're in early position with this hand we're going to be out of position unless unless it happens to be we're against one of the blinds um, but usually it always seems like you're facing someone on the button and and playing a hand like that out of position you know it's the kind of hand where yeah a lot of times you wind up throwing away actually last night I played in a game uh, where I had about 20 pairs in the course of the night and I didn't hit one set and uh, you know it gets expensive by the end of the night whether you're in a tournament or, or a cash game so uh, my best advice is get lucky and flop a set. That makes it a lot easier. <laughs> if only. All right, thanks, Roy. Sure. Good to talk to you. Mike. Hi. Welcome. You're on the air. This is Roy Winston. Uh, hi, Roy. Uh, this is Eric. Hey, Eric. Hey, how's it going? Um, I just had a quick question. Uh, I usually play cash, so I'm a little more comfortable with that, but I play in a weekly home game tournament. The play is kind of like a two-table sit-and-go. Okay. I just had a question as to uh, whether or not you think I was making a mistake in this particular situation that seems to come up a lot. About halfway through the tournament, right before we get down to the final one table and combine, there'll be a lot of players sitting with pretty short stacks, kind of like I'd say anywhere from 10 to 20 big blinds. Okay. And uh, I frequently find myself getting in a situation where I'll be picking on someone's big blind, someone who is showing the aptitude to fold a lot, but they'll decide to make a stand, and I find myself getting two to one and calling with hands like 8-9, figuring to have um, a hand that matches up with something like ace-jack and not be, you know, getting the right odds generally, I wouldn't be worse than 33%. But, you know, it seems like a pretty volatile way to play. But at the same time, you know, I won't get very far in the tournament. I just hang around with 15 big blinds or so. I just wonder what you thought about that. Is it, you know, worth it to take a what could be a plus EV gamble, or should I be a little tighter? Well, you know, it's, it's, that's a great question, and actually, uh, I've had the same discussion with a lot of uh, friends and uh, um, Mike Mattis and I talked about this just the other day. I think that I'm not a big, I don't like to take those those uh, those gambles, and the reason is usually, if you think about, let's say you have to do four of them in your event or three of them in your event, your odds of winning all three are, are slim. 
Uh, and even though you're getting a positive EV about it, um, in a cash game, I would take those gambles. If I think the EV is positive and I, you know, I'm getting the right odds to call based on the hand I put them on, the hand I have, and what the pot size is and how much I have to call, uh, in a cash game, that always makes sense to me. But in a tournament, is about survival. So the value of all the chips is not the same. And as you, as you um, make those calls in those situations and you wind up doubling up the short stacks, number one is that uh, the next time you face him, he's not going to be a short stack. And secondly, when you, if you lose those hands, you may put yourself into the position where you're down to 10, 12 big blinds, and, and all of a sudden you're forced to uh, uh, be in that situation. I really still think that um, unless you have a lot of chips and they're very short, I don't I don't love those calls because like I said the value of the chips in a tournament is you know you can't replace them and they, be, they become more valuable towards the end because the EV on those chips should you get to the money in the cashing part starts to become a lot higher okay um, I just have a question now, what if the, you're one of those players who's kind of in the middle of the field um, then along with the other people who are around 15 to 20 big blinds um, should you only be looking then I should I maybe step away from blind steals if I'm not sure, I would want to be totally committed to the hand. Well, you know, that's, that's also a good question as well. Now, um, a lot of times the blinds can sometimes give away their hands, too, so I try to watch them carefully and see whether or not they're a guy that's, you know, looked at his hand and looks like he's not interested in defending his blind. You know, I was playing with uh, um, <clears throat> probably one of the better players in poker, and there was a basketball game on in the, in the background, and I noticed when he wanted to play his blinds, he was kind of watching the action. And when he gave up on and we looked at his blinds and it wasn't that good, he was watching the basketball game. So I think if you can get a little information on, on how they, you, whether you think they're going to come in or whether they, they're really watching the action like they have a big hand and they want to do something. So if you can do what I would call an educated blind steal, so you're picking your situation carefully, I think that will allow you to be much more successful with it. But, you know, the blind steals, depending on what the antes and the blinds are and how you sit, uh, you know, obviously you got to do some of those. But in a sit-and-go, like this is, you know, with a two-table tournament, I would adopt kind of a sit-and-go format or sit-and-go philosophy. I'm really going to play, be playing tight uh, the early and the mid part of it. And then towards the end, you know, you're obviously uh, going to have to loosen up and play. But um, so I would say that uh, situational blind steals that seem to make sense, you know, are still good. And... Yeah, you, you, you're going to get caught sometimes and have to throw away hands. So hopefully you're getting away with enough of them to make it a, a positive event overall. Okay. Yeah, thank you. All right. Pleasure having you, and take care. All right. Uh, thank you. Thanks. Bye. Hi. Welcome to Calling Station. This is Roy Winston. Hi, Roy. I'm uh, trying to get into uh, Pot Limit Omaha a little bit more because my uh, main game has just been Hold'em. And, uh, and as you know, you're aware, there's a, a lot of little subtle differences between the two games as far as um, what hands you bet on. So I was wondering uh, what your opinion would be on uh, flop action with, um, you know, a, a really good, like, pot limit um, Omaha high-low hand, uh, you know, something like um, uh, pocket aces, maybe single or double suited, something like that. I mean, how, how much pressure do you tend to put on a uh, table with uh, uh, semi-decent to good holding pre-flop and PLO versus holding? I think that's a really good question. And actually, in, uh, in, this, in the current issue of Card Player, I actually uh, wrote about a hand just like that where, where um, Zach Hyman had uh, um, pocket aces, but although they were dry aces, they weren't suited. I think in, in PLO, um, particularly before the flop and, and after the flop too, I think position is uh, even more important than it is in, in Hold'em. And I think in so situationally, if I have double suited uh, um, aces in in uh, you know kind of mid to late position, I'm almost always going to uh, repot with it. But if I have um, if I'm in the blinds, I'm going to play it a lot tighter. And it's funny that uh, these days, and I played a lot of PLO during the World Series, a lot of the cash games. Uh, I saw people repotting out of the blinds frequently, and sometimes with not even as hands as strong as that. You know, with maybe just dry aces or even kings sometimes, which I think is you know, crazy in PLO, because you're going to, you know, a lot of times if the pot gets big enough pre-flop, you're almost uh, going to be committed after the flop. And I think, sure. you know, like anything else in poker, you really want to feel like you're putting your money in where you, you know, you're having a, an advantage. And I think in PLO, you sometimes get trapped in a pot where you don't. So by mm -hmm. controlling the pot size pre-flop when you're out of position, it leaves you more options post-flop. And the other thing is, okay, so let's say you wake up to double suited aces, you know, uh, you know, you got a really great hand like uh, ace, ace, king, jack, double suited, and you're in the small blind. Well, if you flat call there in a pot that's already been raised particularly, uh, you're going to camouflage your hand, and that actually may get you paid off after the flop, where the guy that repots out of the small blind 
people are going to say, oh, he's got aces, so you hit the ace and then everybody runs away unless they, you know, unless they have a big rap or something and a good way to beat you. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, I do. So I think that, you know, treading lightly and controlling pot size and PLO is very important uh, versus, uh, you know, kind of ramming and jamming. Now, again, you know, in position, I'm a little more aggressive with that. Uh, but uh, out of position, I really like to be a little more tentative. Okay. Do you think uh, that there would be, say, you're in a uh, PLO tournament and you're in early position, the blinds are under the gun, and uh, you get a hand like what we were discussing, somebody in later position raises it, um, do you think that there would be uh, justification for going all in, especially in uh, the later stages of the tournament at that point, or would you rather wait until the flop to make a move like that? Well, you know, it, particularly in a tournament, I like to wait. And the reason is because the chips become much more valuable and you can't rebuy. So in a, you know, in a cash game, if you have a small edge, you know, I like pushing that at times and over a lifetime I know I'm going to make out. But in the tournaments, if you don't stay in the tournament and if you wind up pushing all in pre-flop with a hand like that, um, I think that you're committing yourself to either, you know, get a lot of chips or go home. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, my style of play is to kind of hang around and try to put my, my chips in as a bigger favorite. And in PLO, pre-flop, you're never, you know, it's not like you have pocket aces in a hold'em game. You're not an 80% favorite no matter what you have. Sure. Uh, and after the flop, you could be, you know, a serious dog even with pocket aces. So I, I like to control a situation. And, you know, for me, it's about the, the flop play and the turn play in PLO where, uh, where I feel like I have, you know, the, I'm a favorite based on my draw or my, my current holding, and then play aggressively with that, where, you know, let's say you're in the small blind and you have uh, two limpers and you complete and uh, you miss the flop. Well, you got out of there just cheap, and, and the aces, which, you know, I, I just don't like putting in too many chips where I feel like I'm, um, at best, a coin flip. Uh, I feel like I'm a better player, and I like to get my money in when I'm further ahead. I see. Well, thank you very much. Sure. Hi, uh, you're on the air with Roy Winston. This is Calling Station. Hi, Roy. My name is Scott. I'm from Tampa. Hey, Scott. How you doing? Um, very good. I was just um, reading the other day on Wednesday, actually, that uh, you're going to be coaching uh, Dennis Phillips, the chip leader from the World Series. Uh, yep, that's correct. H how did that come about? Well, you know, it's kind of an interesting story. Uh, before the World Series, um, uh, one of my good friends and a guy I've been playing with poker with for a long time, Joe McGowan, uh, he and I talked about the possibility of doing some coaching for some people, and we've done some all along. You know, there were two women this year. One was a woman, Rosalind Cuarto, who made the final table in the ladies' WSOP event, and another woman, Janice Kim, who was at the WPT Championship ladies' event, too, that were students of mine that I coached. And um, uh, Joe and I also work with some other players, uh, uh, unfortunately, the best of the bunch uh, we kind of have a confidentiality agreement with, so he didn't want it out there, and he did had an extremely uh, good World Series this year. So I, I think that, you know, if you look at all other sports, you know, everything from golf, tennis, baseball, football, there's coaching involved. And, and you know, people look at game films, people study their opponents. And in poker, you know, there's a lot of us that remember who we play and remember little things about them, but there's really very little true coaching that goes on. And I think... Uh, poker is one of those one of those uh, activities that that coaching could really help. So, we came up with the plan to try to work with someone at the final table because we're going to have this gap of almost three months. Uh, and uh, we were fortunate enough to meet Dennis when he was playing down um, from around 45 players to the final nine, and you know he knew what we were involved with, and we had some discussions, and uh, uh, he liked what our plan was, and um, we decided to all of us to partner up together and do this. And I think it's interesting because I I really couldn't have had a better uh, person to work with than Dennis, because not only is you know he the chip leader, but he's he's a very skilled player. He's a guy that's been a winning cash player for a number of years, playing in you know decent games in St. Louis, and he's got a lot of skill. Uh, so it's always easier to work with someone that's uh, you know ninety percent along the way than than to get someone who just kind of got a little lucky, if you know what I mean. All right. Well, what is the plan? <laughs> Well, without giving up too much of our proprietary information, well, you know, one of the things that we did, which I think um, I think nobody else really did so much, is we were there, a few of us studying the players towards the end. So I think we have good information on his opponents, and, you know, we, uh, we have that uh, which will help us. And the other thing is, I think, you know, to be in those final table situations, I remember the first uh, big final table I had, you know, I was excited and I was, you know, thrilled to be there, but I was a little nervous. And, and uh, not only do you have the cameras in your face and not only are you maybe unprepared to think about some of the situations, 
but there's a lot of there's a lot of situational stuff that you want to think about. Um, you know, it's like in medicine, you really, in most critical situations, and flying is the same way too, uh, you know, my, my two previous careers flying in medicine, you don't want to have to think of new things when you're in a critical situation. You want to have thought about them ahead of time and kind of know what to do. Do you know what I mean? It's just like, uh, you know, when, you, when you're playing a hand, you want to be thinking far enough ahead in the options, just like you would in chess, that when a, when a guy raises you on the turn, you've already anticipated that, and your response to it, you know, in your head and your options, you know, you have an algorithm that's worked with it. So, you know, we're going to go over a lot of situations with him uh, based on what we feel his opponents are going to throw at him. And we're going to do things like have him prepared for, you know, big stack play, mid stack play, short stack play, um, being able to deal with situations as they arise. And, you know, poker is a dynamic, uh, it's, a, it's a dynamic process where, you know, player X that's playing against him may um, accumulate a big chip stack and start to play differently, or, or a player Y may lose a couple of hands and then go on tilt and be ripe for the taking. So being able to adapt to those situations and be able to, to provide him real-time data support, I think, is something that would be good. Well, and you talk about how poker is dynamic, but and you're talking about how you know all this information about these players, but is, is that still going to be relevant information um, after four months' time? Well, I, I, that's a really good question, and I think just like Dennis is going to improve his game and, and change some things and so on, I imagine everybody will, but that's why... You know, just the same thing when you look at a game film from a previous, you know, uh, when the Giants were studying the Patriots, you know, the Patriots were still changing and adapting and, and everybody's um, growing, but you have to get the best fit you can at the time and then adapt it as the changes come. So um, we'll take what we have and we'll, we'll see how it, how it un starts to unfold and we'll adapt and uh, hopefully overcome any, uh, any uh, obstacles we, we uh, seem to hit. You know, it's, it's a tough thing and you can still do everything right in poker and lose, you know, you just... Uh, uh, it's, you know, one of those things. All right. Well, good luck to Philip. Thank you for answering my question. Well, thanks a lot for the call, and uh, you have a good day. You too. Thanks. Well, I want to thank everybody for joining us uh, on an episode of Calling Station. Uh, you can always find my blog on the Card Player website at uh, www.cardplayer.com. And you can uh, contact me directly at uh, winstonpoker at yahoo.com. And my blog is oraclepoker.com. So a lot of, lot of dot coms in there. We thank you for tuning in, and uh, we'll see you next time on Calling Station. Mm -hmm.